A didn't just save me, it saved my life, but it uh, it gave me a new life worth living. And uh, the truth is, that's not why I came into AA. I came into AA to get my own life back. <laughs> you know, I was losing all my stuff, and I wanted to get my stuff. I wanted to get her back. I wanted to get it back. I wanted to get that back. I wanted to get the kids back. And and uh, and I thought AA was going to give me all that back. And and you guys had different plans. Uh, I I thank God I look in the rearview mirror now, and I thank God I didn't get what I wanted when I came in here. And uh, but uh, you know the the, uh, the 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 topic that you were talking about a way out uh, was a great topic uh, because that's what that's what I was given uh, and uh, and it if, if you're if you're a big book guy on page seventeen is where it's mentioned the tremendous fact and the and the, uh, the the tremendous fact is is that we have discovered a common solution and. Uh, we have a way out which we can absolutely agree and and when i guess when they say we they're talking about the first 100 they're, they're not talking about the people who come in here and do it any way they want they're talking about the people who followed the path the, that followed the precise specific clear-cut exact directions that are laid out in the book and uh and they found a way out doing that and and, and what comes to mind when i read that line is is the couple paragraphs before that and uh and that is the uh the amazing bond, the, the uh, absolute uh, common problem that we share. Uh, uh, Bill Wilson called it a common suffering that we share that binds us together, and uh, and uh, and that's that's to me the magic of Alcoholics Anonymous. The magic of Alcoholics Anonymous to me happens in the parking lot when when the newcomer walks up and the experienced member greets him and shakes his hand and introduces himself and they start swapping stories. You know, they start swapping war stories and i and i think that is the real miracle of alcoholics anonymous yeah i mean the, the program is is uh what is the way out <laughs> but but the without that common uh suffering without that common problem without that identification taking place uh when i come into the rooms and hear your stories and and if i don't say yeah that happened to me yeah i did that yeah i felt like that then, then I got nothing in common with you guys because, as it states in the paragraph before that, that you know we come from all different walks of life, different political views, different religious views, different uh, economic uh, situations, and uh, races, religions, you know, whatever you want to uh, label it. But, but what binds us is that we all have a common problem, and but what keeps us together is the common solution. And, and I got to be honest with you, I fell prey to the idea that I was going to be able to stay sober on the fellowship and uh and and I and I guess why not right I mean if you don't have to do a fourth and fifth step I mean I don't think I was the only one looking ahead uh in those steps and seeing four five and nine in there and going wait a minute you know that's as our book uses the word drastic twice right it uses it in this chapter in chapter two of these drastic proposals I mean who wants to uh, who wants self-examination and confession of our sins? I mean, who wants to do these? Are drastic freaking proposals that we're that we're putting out there, and they are. I mean, that that you know, they say we don't have any willpower. But let me tell you something: it takes some willpower to write a fourth step and do a fifth step, and then start making amends in step nine. And and so, I guess if you could avoid that, why not? You know, and uh, and so I came into Alcoholics Anonymous uh, and and gravitated towards the don't drink and go to Denny's crowd. You know what I mean? Like that and I thought that was AA, and and so that's what we did every freaking day. You know, we went that we went to meetings in Denny's. You know, I was doing my three meetings a day in Denny's, and you know, uh, that became my life, AA and Denny's. And and I'm gonna tell you something. You you're sitting there, coming from what I thought was this exciting life that I had, and now I'm sitting at F and Denny's with you guys every night. Uh, it was like not what I had in mind, you know, and, and then I hear this guy at the podium tell me that he has a life beyond his wildest dreams. And I'm going, this asshole don't even have a job. You know, he, he don't, I don't even think he has a girlfriend or a car, you know, and he's talking about a life beyond his wildest dream. What in the hell is going on here? And, and so I spent my, my first few months unencumbered by sponsorship in the steps, you know, and, uh, and just not drinking and going to meetings and, and. And that's a great suggestion, by the way, but but we should tell them the whole story. And that is don't drink, go to meetings, get a sponsor, work the steps and, you know, not just stop and don't drink and go to meetings because uh, people who don't drink and go to meetings who are the real alcoholic that this book is addressing uh, don't make it. 
you know, and and I, and, I, and and I'll tell you, at nine at ninety days when I was ready to pick up my my red chip, uh, I was falling apart. I was absolutely falling apart. You know, uh, my uh, one of my favorite communicators is uh, Sandy Beach, and and uh, I love Sandy. I used to, I was a Sandy stalker, and uh, I still do. By the way, I still stalk his ass on on uh, YouTube and shit, but. Uh, Sandy's the bomb, man. And, and Sandy said something so simple and so profound one time. He said, you know what happens when you stop drinking? You're sober. There's the problem. Mm -hmm. And oh my God, was he right? I mean, sobriety was my problem. And I'm not, I'm talking about from day one that I was born, as far back as I can remember to the time I stopped drinking. Sobriety was my problem. I couldn't do sober. I couldn't do life. Uh, unencumbered by some substance, you know, something that there was something internal going on in me that uh, that came alive again when you took my medication away, you know, you, you took my alcohol, you took my, my drug, you took my stuff, you know, and now I'm stuck with these raw freaking emotions. And, and Charlie Parmalee, who's my other idol uh, from the Joe and Charlie Big Book Seminars, and, and Charlie used to say, you'll feel better when you come into AI, right? you'll feel fear better, you'll feel anger better, you'll feel anxiety better. And he was right. I mean, I was I was just white knuckling it, man. I was just I mean, I was punching shit. I was, you know, calling my ex, you know, telling her I knew what was wrong with me now. I'm an alcoholic. Uh, that's the problem. As long as I don't drink, everything's going to be great. And she responded with, no, you're just an asshole who drinks, you know, and hung up the phone. And my God, was she accurate? And I didn't know that at the time, by the way. I only know that looking in the rearview mirror. And she was right. I, I was just I, I was an asshole that needed alcohol not to be an asshole, you know? I mean, it, 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 that that's that was my solution. Bill's story, right? The the market crashes, people are jumping from tall buildings, people are committing suicide, they're killing themselves. Bill said, F that, I went back to the bar. You know, the alcohol was Bill's solution, not his problem. Alcohol was my solution, not my problem, until it was my problem, you know, until it was my problem. And, you know, I, I was that... Uh, day one, as far as back as I can remember, I can remember being five years old on my way to school, throwing up from fear, physically sick. I mean, whether it was self-induced or not, I was physically sick from fear on my way to school. I was that kid in school who had his homework done. And if you told me to get up in front of the class, I wasn't going. I was not get. give me the F, just move along. You know, I'm not going up there, you know, send me to the office. I don't care what you want to do, but I'm not doing it. You know, and whatever that fear was, failure, not being accepted and, you know, not doing good. And I don't know what it was. There was this inner dialogue that told me I should be taller. I should be heavier. Uh, I, I shouldn't have this nose that I walk around with. My ears shouldn't stick out like they do. I should be smarter. I should be an athlete, you know, which is that was my dream. I want to be a baseball player. But, I'm, you know, why am I not good enough to play baseball professionally? And just this inner dialogue that told me I wasn't good enough. And I, and I think that's probably a, you know, a lot of us have that common, uh, we just don't fit in. You know what I mean? It just, I just always felt like I was on the outside looking in and man, I don't know where that comes from. I, I, I don't know if, uh, if I was just wired differently, uh, uh, early on, or if, uh, if there was the, if the violence that took place in my house had something to do with that. And that's, that's very possible that, uh, that, uh, that my, uh, you know, my dad was a violent drunk. Uh, you never know who was coming back and coming home, whether it was uh, the guy that was going to come in and uh, my mother would ask, where the hell were you? And uh, he'd, all hell would break loose. And uh, I, I have visions of him sitting on my mother's chest, slapping the shit out of my mother. You know, I, I, I have visions of us sitting around us. There was three of us, ended up four kids, but there was three of us sitting around with popcorn on our laps watching TV while they would beat the crap out of each other in front of us. And, uh, and then some days he would come home and say, hey, pack up the car, we're going camping, and we'd go up into the mountains of Pennsylvania and, and have a great weekend and, and come back. And, you know, you were just always kind of waiting for the shoe to drop, you know. I mean, that God forbid my mother say something out of line on the way camping, you know, or because the camping trip would be over, all hell would break loose again. I, I remember my dad physically throwing my mother out of the car and driving off at times. And, the three of us would look at each other and go, well, mom's gone. <laughs> you know, it was just, just average childhood, right? And and that'll, by the way, that, that'll create a slightly nervous disposition in a child. It might be why I needed a drink. It is not why I'm an alcoholic. You know, I'm an alcoholic because I can't 
stop when I want. I can't stay stop when I want to, and I can't control it once I start. And that's what defines me. And, you know, the, the page 44, the, for the fourth time, Bill describes us. You know, when you honestly want to stay stop, you find you can't. And once you start, you can't control the amount you drink, then you're probably an alcoholic. And because there's a lot of people, uh, I actually spoke uh, the other night, two nights ago, in an Al Anon uh, convention type gratitude thing which was really interesting because i feel like the perpetrator when i'm there and you know and and uh and the, the truth is they have the same feelings that i do you know they they grew up in the same violence they grew up in this and i didn't see that until they pointed that out to me that you know they drank for the same reason that i drank to numb the pain you know to to to, to get that comfortable relaxed feeling and and the problem is they stopped at three or two, you know, they got they got a comfortable, relaxed feeling. I get a got to get up and go do some kind of feeling. I got a kind of a different, uh, and and the fact is, I once I start, I can't control the amount I take. I I, I fire for a fact. I, I don't know anything about control drinking. I don't know what that's all about. But that you know, that I really believe that I was uh, emotionally dis predisposed. That I was an emotional cripple from day one. And I also believe that I was genetically predisposed, which is, uh, if you look at my family tree, it's uh, there's a long line of, of uh, both my grandfathers are dead from this illness. Uh, my grandmother on the Irish side died uh, from alcoholism. Uh, I, my dad had three brothers and two sisters. He has one sister alive today, aside from himself. Uh, the rest directly related to alcoholism. Uh, and uh, he drinks a half a fifth of vodka to go to sleep every day. I, 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 he says it's potato vodka. I'm not sure what that means. I think he thinks it's a vegetable. Hmm. But long line, my mother had four kids. Three of us uh, ended up in recovery. Uh, and one, my, my baby sister, uh, about 10 years ago, died of an overdose, you know, and it just genetically predisposed, you know. And, and look, my my childhood, I hated it. I hated my teen years, you know. You get you get the puberty. A guy gets the puberty. All he can think about is women, and he can't talk to them. That's a tough way to live. You know, I'm scared to death to ask anybody out because if they say no, I'm going to have to kill myself. And uh, and that's you know, I live a life of loneliness. I live a life of apartness. And you know, my mom remarried. I got divorced. My dad left when I was about six or seven years old. My mother remarried and another violent drunk. And uh, God bless her. She was just trying to survive with four kids. And uh, and this guy and I started to go get violent. Uh, you know, I was getting into my early teens and uh, I wasn't going to have none of his stuff. And uh, I needed to get out of the house. And, you know, I bought a car at 14 uh, in anticipation to get my license at 16. And then I'm going to be the hell out of here and I'm going to be on my own and life will be great. You know, and, you know, that's all I could think about, by the way, from age 13 on was get a job, get a car, get a girl and all will be good. You know, I'll be happy. And that's all I wanted out of life from 13 years old on. And uh, I thought that's what measured success, right? What you drive, who's on your arm, what your house looks like. I thought that was the measure of success. And I think we're kind of taught that, you know, that, that that's what success looks like. And that's what happiness looks like. And so I, I drive to, uh, I long as two years of my life, by the way, from 14 to 16. And uh, I turned 16 years old and I drive to Harrisburg, PA without a license to get my permit. I come back. Uh, get my driver's license and my cousin Russell finds out I got a driver's license and you're valuable. You have a driver's license. And, and, uh, he, he calls me up and says, you know, we're going to a dance tonight. Come pick us up. I hear you got a car and a license. And I said, yeah, I don't do the dance thing. I never, you know, look, I wasn't that guy. I didn't go to the homecomings. I didn't go to the prom. I didn't do none of that. So I, there's no way I was getting out on the dance floor and making an ass of myself. And it just wasn't happening. And Russ said, no, 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 you don't have to dance. We'll, there's a band playing, rock band playing. We'll just, you know, you can listen to the band. And I said, ah, whatever. So I go pick him up. And I pick up my buddy Rat. Everybody's got a friend named Rat, right? So, so Rat, I don't know if anybody here is from Pennsylvania, but Pennsylvania, the drinking age was 21, right? And you had to have an LCB card at the time when I was growing up, a liquor control board card with your picture ID on it and, to get served. But Rat was like a 16-year-old Italian that looked 25. 30 you know he was already balding and had hair coming out of his shirt and so rat was the designated going the state store guy you know because they wouldn't card him you know and rat goes into the state store and comes out with a bottle of boone's farm strawberry hill and a bottle of orange vodka and uh halfway through that bottle of boone's farm strawberry hill 
uh, I went from Pee Wee Herman to John Travolta, you know, and I had the absolute freaking time of my life. Absolute time of my life. My first time ever on a dance floor. First time ever touching a girl, you know. I mean, I danced with every girl in the dance, whether they wanted to or not. I mean, that was just, the you know, ladies, that guy that keeps coming around in front of you, you know, and you keep trying to dance with your girlfriends, but this guy keeps coming around. That was me, you know, and uh, I absolutely, uh, the fear, the anxiety, the feeling less than, gone, fixed. The inner unmanageability, I like to call it, cured. I'm tall enough. I'm big enough. I'm good looking enough. I'm smart enough. And I can dance, right? Truth is. I probably look like a total ass out there, but I'll tell you what, I had fun. I had fun. Short of it, 20 year run. <laughs> 20 year run. I mean, that's the, that's the, that's it in a nutshell, really. I, I mean, there was never any moderation. I, uh, I, I fired for effect. I liked the effect produced by alcohol, uh, language that I learned later. You know, I had no idea what, I, I was fun and I want to do it again. And my drug of choice pretty much became whatever you had, you know, uh, alcohol, by the way, is my drug of choice. It's that, that is it. I, I like other stuff. Uh, I'll put some other stuff with it, but when all else fails, alcohol was always, I would always do the job. You know, it, it, uh, it was legal. It was easy to get, and it did exactly for me what I needed it to do. And, uh, you know, I didn't know it, but I engaged alcohol. I, I engaged the physical allergy once I started, uh, you know, the, uh, Inner unmanageability was fixed. Uh, the problem is, is some consequences start to happen if you drink the way I drank, you know, or and with the people that I drank, and and you drank and mixed other substances with that booze. You know, I I went through the windshield three days after that first drink. You know, I I wrecked three more cars that year, got arrested three times that year, uh, lost my driver's license before my 17th birthday. I didn't get that back for eight years, uh, and I got my first felony at 19. And I love Bill's line, ominous warnings, which I failed to eat, right? I was going to figure this out. Even the guys that, that I hung out with, like in Bill's story, you know, the, the, the ramen stances of my friends terminated in a row, you know, like, dude, we, we can't be with you tonight. You know, you know you're not going to eat those with the drink or tonight, are you? You know, like they would say stuff like that, right? Because we know what happens when you eat those and you drink. You know, you go to jail. That's what happens, you know, or you crash a car and we're not, we don't want to be part of that. And then they started to back away. Hey, you know, and I'll, you know, maybe you should chill, you know, I hear stuff like that. Maybe, you know, maybe you should just drink, you know, and, and, uh, and I would say, no, 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 I got this. You know, I, I, and there was just, you know, the funny thing about those 20 years, uh, trading, by the way, everything I loved in life, you know, any, any relationship that I had, any, position that I had, uh, any success that I had, I, I was willing to trade that rather than take a look at whether I should quit or stop drinking or not. I, I still didn't know that I didn't have the power of choice in whether I drank or not. I had no idea that I was emotionally addicted to alcohol and drugs. I had no idea what that meant. And, and that's really what happened. I mean, you know, my... The, the, the difference between dependent and addicted, you know, the, the dependent... I mean, everybody that drinks long enough or drinks enough or does enough drugs gets dependent. I mean, everybody does, right? And and my friend Jimmy D, who who drank with me for tw almost 20 years, right? He got a call one night from the bar. His wife said, if you don't come home, I'm leaving you. He went home. You know, I mean, I'm on my third marriage. You know, Jimmy went home, right? He saw a sufficient consequence. He went home. Now, I'm sure he shook, rattled, and rolled. He probably detoxed because we had been partying, you know? And, but he he's still married. You know, 30 some years later, he's still married, has four kids. You know, I was willing to trade everything for the effect that was produced by alcohol. There was no way that was going to be eliminated. That, that was not the problem. You are the problem. That's not, you trying to tell me what to do is the problem. You know, and I just couldn't see it. You know, there was just no way. You know, the, the dependent, like Jimmy, goes home, rat shakes around, maybe goes to detox, maybe goes to treatment. He comes out of treatment and says, shit, never doing that again. You know, I'm, I'm not going down that road again, I'm not taking those again, you know, where I'm going to, I know you guys, some of you guys will relate. You go to treatment 90 days, spend 20 grand and come out and get high before you get home, you know, because I can't stand the way I freaking feel, you know, I can't stand life. I can't do sober, you know, and, and just, I mean, that was me, you know, you know, I, I ended up in 1970, uh, 
1978, I had a son. 1979, I got married. And in 1980, I moved to South Florida. And if anybody knows what was going on in South Florida in 1980, it was, uh, I found a higher powder in, in South Florida, I'll tell you that. And uh, it was, uh, it took the drink into a whole nother level. I mean, it was like, you know, I found a way to drink around the clock and still make it to work. That was incredible, you know? And I mean, they were delivering the shit on the job. It was just insane. Uh, I went to a level that my my ex-wife didn't really want to go. She had that we had a son. She had that responsible gene. I'm an I'm an addict. I'm an alcoholic. I'm off to the races, and and uh, and I don't even know it. You know, I don't. Even, I'm, I become an absentee father, absentee husband, and I became the best employee in the in the workplace. I will tell you that. I, I, nobody moved like I did. You know, they used to say, "Look at that son of a bitch." We need like ten of him. You know, and. Uh, I always look back at that and laugh and, and I was spending $300 a day to go to work to make 80, you know, and it, uh, it made perfect sense at the time, but, uh, looking back on it, it's, uh, not too smart, you know, but it, uh, it's, it started to bring me to my knees, you know, um, I don't know how we stayed married for as long as we did 1989. My wife wanted out. She was willing to do anything to get out. And I won. I got the house. I got custody of my son at that time. Uh, I got everything. I got everything I wanted. You want out, then get out, you know? And and probably the first time in my life that, uh, that I ever took a look at myself, you know? Probably the first time I ever reflected uh, on where I was, you know? And you know what's incredible with this Zoom thing is the, and, and kind of, uh, kind of weird is that uh, I hate telling this part of my story, uh, and it's even harder on Zoom because I'm I'm sitting in the room where I, where it took place, and you know I uh, I couldn't believe this bitch could do this to me, and I'm a victim here now, and I can't believe and and I hate to even say this I can't believe that I'm stuck raising this child while she's out there having a good time, you know, and I, and that was where my mindset was. I was like I'm I'm stuck in the house, drinking by myself, and I try to commit suicide with my son in the other room. You know, I'm, I'm in my bedroom right there. He's sitting right where we're sitting. And uh, and that's that's like blows my mind with the Zoom thing that because I because that never happened before where I was telling the story from where it happened. And, and it, you know, look, it was it was probably the emotional bottom uh, in my life. Uh, not enough to get me to stop drinking, but enough to put the drugs away. You know, I begged my wife to come back, my ex. Uh, I'll, I'll never do another. I thought I was a drug addict. I thought I was a drug addict who drank. You know, that's what I thought. If I could stop this cocaine thing, uh, everything would be fine. And the truth is, I was two years clean when I landed in AA. <laughs> you know, you know, she she agreed. She came back. We had another child immediately, and it took me two years to hit a physical bottom with alcohol. Uh, it took me down. It just took me down. I uh, I came home one night. I don't even know what my my ex said, uh, and uh, I probably asked me where I was at two in the morning and uh and I knocked her down in front of my two kids and god I hated my father for that uh disgusting you know disgusting and I gave my two children the same picture that I had uh, as a child and uh beginning of the beginning beginning of the end depends on your perception right this is a disease of perception right it uh I was arrested, charged, restraining order. Uh, she got the house. She got custody of both children. Uh, you know, it was, uh, you go find a place to live, pal. I don't care if it's your house or not, but your kids and your ex are staying here. And uh, I ended up in a hotel room in a day's in, uh, in Fort Lauderdale, and uh, trying to drink myself to death. I didn't have the guts to, to take myself out, and I'm just trying to drink myself to death, and I, and I hit Alcohol stopped working. And I, I want to tell you, I would not be here if it still worked. You know, my, my former sponsor who passed away uh, three years ago used to say that alcohol would give me permission to do whatever I wanted. And then it would give me absolution afterwards. You know, and that is so true. You know, it would it would clear my conscience after I step on somebody's toes, after I destroy a relationship, after I, you know, do whatever it takes to get what I need to get. Uh, I could drink myself uh, into into a state of. Uh, of atonement, if you will, you know, and, and just and and get and get permission and get absolution in the same night. And I could not get any relief in the bottle. And if it's if I still could, I'd still be there. I would still be there. I was at a point where I couldn't get any relief and I couldn't stop. 
and and I was around the clock. I was drinking to pass out to get up to drink to pass out. And I have that moment of, you know, we always, we call it a moment of clarity, maybe a, a moment of God's grace. I think and now I think God said, you're done. I got a job for you, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and I reach out to my sister who's in AA. And now my sister and I had never talked about AA. It was like a taboo. It was the elephant in the room on the holidays. Joel's in AA. Don't talk about it, you know, and, and, uh, and that kind of thing, you know, and, and I had never talked to her about it. Nobody ever said you should go to AA. Uh, but, uh, I reached out to my sister and said, I need help. I can't stop drinking. And, uh, she took me to my first AA meeting. It was a place called the Fifth Chapter Club in Lighthouse Point, Florida. I don't remember anything about the meeting. I, I think it was a big book meeting. I don't know. You know, uh, all I remember is the guy chairing the meeting looked like Papa Smurf. And uh, and Papa Smurf got up at the end of the meeting and asked if there was anybody who wanted to start a new way of life. And I jumped out of my chair and grabbed a white chip. It was March 26, 1991. Uh, and my journey in Alcons Anonymous started. And, and uh, it's the only white chip I ever picked up, by the way. Uh, and uh, I had no idea what I was getting into. You know, I didn't even know you guys didn't drink. You know, my, my sister had been in AA for years and she drank, you know, so I had no idea that this was like total abstinence. I didn't know this was forever. I thought you guys figured it out. And, uh, but I, I didn't have anywhere else to go. I didn't know where else to go. And, and when I heard your stories, the connection was made. I knew, yeah, I felt like that. Yeah, I did that. Yeah, it happened to me. I just didn't ask, what did you do? <laughs> You know, I did that. I asked that. I said, what are we doing? They said, we're going to Denny's. And I said, okay, you know, let's go to Denny's or we're going to ice cream or we're going to the clock or whatever the hell restaurant they were hanging out in. And, uh, and so my, like I said, my first three months were white knuckle sobriety. And, uh, and that those 90 days came, I came to pick up my right chip, white chip at the end of that 90 days. And, uh, I was at a 10 PM meeting at the fifth chapter club and, and I couldn't do it anymore. I just couldn't do it. I told you guys that this sucks. I don't know what, what's going on here. You, you know, I, I'm in Loserville, you know, half of you guys don't work. You know, I don't know what you guys, all you do is go to meetings and, and Denny's. And, uh, you know, I just, I feel like I'm in a bad Saturday night live skit or something like I want to share, and you know, uh, we're all going to share about our problems and, you know, it just, I can't do this as a group therapy, you know, I can't do it. And, and I'm in the same place in the rooms of AA as I was in a hotel room, the only difference is there's no booze, but I'm freaking stark raven sober. You know, I'm the, I'm the five-year-old again. I'm the 15-year-old again before he picks up that Boone's farm at 16. I can't do this. I'm, I'm, why I'm, I'm bugging out. I'm punching stuff. I'm kicking shit. I'm raging. And, uh, and I'm in, you know, what's the difference really when you think about it, right? I'm in a hotel room. I can't stop drinking. And I can't get any relief. Well, I'm in AA and I can't drink and I'm not getting any relief. What the hell's the difference? You know, and, and I leave that meeting like this is not going to work for me. And I'm standing at the railing. The fifth chapter club is on the second floor. And Brian H. Uh, Brian Haynes, he would he would use his last name. But look, I'm not anonymous amongst you guys. We're not anonymous amongst each other. Pat Rogan, R-O-G-A-N. It's on the thing there. Uh, Google it. It'll come up. 954-818-3013. Uh, if you want my number, put it go in the chat. Uh, Brian would use his last name if he was here. But Brian approached me and said something unbelievable to me. He said, do you know there's a program here? And I went, yeah, I've been coming to it for three months. He goes, no, you've been visiting the fellowship, right? <laughs> Page 717, the common bond, right? You, you, you just got the common bond. You just connected. You just identified. That's all you did. There's a program here. And would you like to hear it? And I said, why not? And Brian took me to his little Mazda behind the fifth chapter club and read the doctor's opinion to me. I don't know where you were hiding that. Uh, I never heard it in the meetings. Uh, I'm sure they talked about it. Maybe I didn't want to hear it. I don't know. I was with the people at Denny's, you know, and, uh, and Brian read the doctor's opinion and the freaking light bulb came on, you know, an obsession of the mind coupled with an allergy of the body, you know, a mind to keep saying it's okay to drink because all it can think about is what it's going to do for me and not what it's going to do to me. And once I fall prey to that decision, I have an allergy of the body that insists that I have another drink. Oh my God. No wonder I never went home. I thought it was crazy. Did anybody else think they were crazy when they got here? You know, I've traded wives. <laughs> I've traded children. I've traded careers. I've traded my freedom. I've promised judges that I would never touch another drop if they let me go, 
and I'd be ROR'd. I'd, I'd be let, I'd be let out, and I couldn't make it home. I couldn't make it home. The emotional condition on my way home would become so overwhelming that I would convince myself that I just needed three. If I could just get that, ah, you know, and, and then boom, I'm off to the races again, right? I would go through the drive through pick and pack on my way home every night from work. And call, I would call home and say, I'm on my way home, start dinner. And I'd go through that drive through and get one tall Budweiser for the ride and never freaking make it home. Never. I mean, never. It became an ongoing joke, right? I mean, it just, I couldn't. I didn't know what I didn't know. I didn't know that once I put that drink in me, I had no, I had lost the power of choice. I didn't know that. And Brian explained to me, it doesn't, doesn't the doctor's opinion describe the alcoholic life, right? Restless cerebral discontent, however you want to freaking describe that, right? An emotional cripple, right? That's the way I see that, right? I can't do this freaking life thing. The ease and comfort that comes at once at drink three, right? And then boom, off to the races, right? Off to the races. And come out of that. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. Oh my God. I swear to God, I did not. I, it'll never happen again. Honey, believe me, it will never happen. No, unpack your bags. It, it, I'm done. I'm done with that drinking thing, right? Your honor, I swear to God, you know, my boss, no, no, you'll never see me show up in that condition. You'll never see me show up in my John Travolta clothes again, okay? That's, that's done, right? And I'll wear work clothes, I promise you, I promise you. And, you know, I just I just couldn't do it. I just couldn't stay stopped. And, and Brian, they explained to me what, but then he goes on, and that cycle's repeated over and over again, right? We fall prey to that. We promise we'll never do it again. And that emotional barometer just get, and I make it a couple of days. I could make it three on that fourth day. I'm just a basket case. I'm just, a, I don't know what to do with myself. I don't know what to do, you know, and, and I fall prey. I'm just going to have three again and off the race. You know, I love that one paragraph in chapter three where it says, what about the times where we just deliberately get drunk? knowing the consequences, right? I mean, there's the real alcoholic, right? I know uh, they're going to test me on Friday and I drink anyway, right? <laughs> All I got to do is stay clean for 30 days and I won't go to jail and I drink at 29. <laughs> you know, it's like, I mean, that's the real freaking alcoholic right there, right? And knowing the consequences and still picking up the drink, you know, and that describes my life, man. That describes my life. My recovery took off from that point on. You know, I was not afraid of four. Matter of fact, I probably had my first, uh, if you want to call it personality change, uh, if you want to call it a spiritual experience, you want to call it a, a transformation, started to take place as soon as I started doing my resentment inventory. You know, that, that four-step prayer is so powerful, you know, to pray for somebody you dislike. My, per, my, my life started to change as soon as I started to practice this principle of praying for somebody I hated, you know, praying for my ex, you know, and, and getting relief, by the way, that, that, that story in the back of the book, that freedom from bondage is such a great story. You know, pray for them even if you don't mean it. Do it for two weeks straight, right? I mean, the prayer started out with give her what she deserves, but, but still, be, be, you know, before the two weeks was up, I'm praying for, I, I'm wondering, you know what dawns on me, praying for her? Why would I want the mother of my children to be miserable? Why would I want my children to grow up in a miserable home? Looking at life from a different angle all of a sudden, as soon as we start this inventory process, right? My fear was step five. I, I just, I don't trust. I, you know, a lot of us have trust issues. You know, I didn't trust the two people I should have been able to trust unconditionally growing up. Who am I going to trust when I get here? Look, I sat at Denny's with you guys talking about everybody in those meetings, you know? I mean, you guys were taking everybody's inventory there, you know. And by the way, that's why gossip is deadly, just deadly, you know. It just, you can't, you just got to stop it, you know. It just, it, it's, you know, I, I respect anybody that gets up at that podium. I respect anybody that has the guts to share. You know, I, I suffer from the fear. I walk through the fear. I know what it feels like to get up there. So to criticize anybody that gets up at a podium and and uh, shares their story or, or their experience is just, to me, uh, unconscionable, you know, because uh, I know how difficult it is. But, you know, I was, uh, I couldn't do it. I, 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 Brian, as much as I owe Brian my life for the information he gave me, I was not going to share my fist step with him, you know. And by the way, Brian and I had nothing in common. This idea that you need to have something in common with your sponsor, like I'm 36 years old when I land here. I'm divorced. I have two children. Brian's 24, right? 
he's he doesn't even have a career yet he, i've already lost one you know he he hasn't been married he has no children he's chasing skirts around aa you know we, we all we had in common he had a solution he had a way out <laughs> he had a way out you know i needed a way out and he had it right and and so so here's what happened i uh, i got this tough love men's group that i'm i'm a member of called the boca boys who aren't in boca and they're a bunch of old men you know and and they, but they were tough love guys. I mean, and, and that's probably what I needed at the time. These guys, you know, they'd shut you up in the middle of a share. If you weren't on topic, they'd shut your ass up. You know, they just, enough next, you know, and it, it, that's the kind they were. You had to show up. You were speaking, you had to have a collar on. That's why I put this shirt on, by the way, when I was sitting here earlier. They make sure if you don't have a collar on at that podium, you're not speaking, you know, and don't be showing up in no dirty shirt and ripped pants, you know. They were just that kind of a group, you know, teaching me how to live. I thought they were picking on me. They were trying to teach me some responsibility. They were trying to teach me how to show up in AA to treat it like the sacred place that it is. You know, don't show up looking like a bump. You know, I, I, I worked all day. Well, carry another shirt with you. That's what's, you know, that kind of stuff, right? And these guys say, so when are you going to do your fifth step, Pat? When are you going to do your fifth step? And just to shut them up, I call St. Andrew's Church over here by my house, thinking I'll do it with a priest by law. They can't share it with anybody, right? They, unless they get kicked out of the priesthood, which was a thought, you know. But I figure by law they can't share it. So I call St. Andrews at eleven o'clock at night. Uh, Father, I figured nobody's going to answer the phone. Father Quinn picks up the phone, and uh, I said, "Father," and he goes, "I'm in Alcoholics Anonymous," and he says, "Oh, and you want to do a fifth step?" He says, "Be over here in my office at nine thirty tomorrow morning." And I didn't know it, but the Coral Springs group where I live has been meeting there for years. He knew if an alcoholic was calling him what they wanted. And I spent two and a half hours with uh, Father Quinn the next morning. My life forever changed, uh, forever changed. Uh, you know, the uh, I left that office uh, free. You know, I, I mean, that's the word that comes to mind, free, transformed, transformed. It was a dark to light experience for me. And, and not everybody gets it there. I get that, you know, uh, I mean, a lot of people get it at nine. A lot of people get it as a result of living 10, 11, and 12. But I had an experience, uh, a God experience in step five. I mean, I physically looked at life differently. I left that office and I was looking around the courtyard. This will sound silly. And as a matter of fact, I never even heard anybody share this until I heard Marty Mann's story, <clears throat> the first woman to stay sober in Alcoholics Anonymous. And she had the same experience. Uh, everything was bright. The colors were bright. Everything was like fluorescent. The green was fluorescent green. The reds were fluorescent red. The, I was driving back to work, or to work, looking at this, on the Sawgrass Express. I'm looking around them, and these freaking trees are everywhere, you know? And, it, and, and I saw my first sunset that night. I'm going home, and I'm looking at this gorgeous sky. And I look at the lady at the toll booth, and I go, look at that. And she goes, what? And I said, that. And she goes, yeah, it's a sunset. It's there every night. <laughs> you know, I had been driving that road for 12 years. Never saw it. Never saw it. I had been missing life. It realized that I had been looking at asphalt and bumpers my whole life. I just didn't look up. I was so tormented still. And so all I could think about was what am I going to do? Where am I going to drink after work? You know, how am I going to change what's going on? You know, the problems in my life, the hangover, and you know, when is it going to be beer 30? You know, and, and I just never looked around and saw the beauty. I've been living in South Florida for 10, almost 12 years and never saw the beauty in South Florida. And, you know, uh, the promise that they talk about, the solution that they talk about in this chapter, you know, the, you know, the fact was that I had lost the power of choice and drink. That was the fact, you know, that I couldn't bring into my consciousness with sufficient force, the pain and suffering. It says of a week or a month ago, I couldn't remember the pain and suffering of this morning. That was the truth. My, I would promise my wife when I left the house that I wasn't going to get high that day. And I would, you know, I would forget that promise because how I felt outweighed it. Well, the solution is the great fact. It's just this and nothing less that we've had deep and effective spiritual experiences. You know, what does that look like? I love Carl Jung, right? Ideas, emotions, and attitudes that were the guiding force of these men and women are replaced by a whole new set of conceptions, a whole new set of, of thoughts, feelings, and actions, right? The great fact. The central fact of my life that day became that God entered my heart and began to live in a way which was indeed miraculous and commence to do for me what I couldn't do for myself. What I couldn't do for myself was stay stopped. You know, I just could not get past the torment. You know? 
And that the obsession was lifted. That day, God went from my head to my heart. God went from a thought to a feeling. Exactly what the solution says that that God had entered my heart that day. Now I'm not telling you I don't think about drinking. That's that that my mind still knows that there's relief in that third drink. But what I have now is another go-to, right? I have a different go-to now. I got the same feeling in that fifth step that I got halfway through that bottle of Moon's Farm. I found a new solution, right? Carl Young says that too, right? The spirit becomes the, the solution to the spirits, you know? And that's exactly what happened to me. Now that shows up in different forms, by the way, because some days God works through you. You know, some days God works through the fellowship. Some days God works through my sponsees. Some days God works through my sponsor. And I have to be willing to turn to those solutions rather than the booze. And and that's that's what I do today. That's that's my solution today. You know, and then I get I get to do this. <laughs> you know, I'd be like, I mean, and that's what it was, right? It was a I I I needed to be here, I had to be here, and then I came to a point where I wanted to be here, and now I realize that we get to be here, that we've actually been chosen for something really, really unbelievable. We we get to save lives in here. We get we get to do something that no doctor or psychiatrist or psychologist or clergy or or priest or rabbi gets to do, and that is save alcoholic and addict lives you know because they don't know how we feel you know they they when they tell me they know how they feel no they don't unless they're one of us unless they're one of us no you don't you don't know what it feels like to take a drink against your own better judgment you don't know what it take no you don't want it feels like to take a drink knowing you're going to end up divorced knowing you're going to lose your job knowing you're going to lose custody of your son if you pick up a drink only we know what that feels like right and you know that I know what it feels like because we've swapped stories, you know? We've And that's the magic to me in alcohol. You know, I get to come here and share how broken I am and everybody applauds. And that becomes that becomes the gift, right? Our dark secrets unlock pain and misery for other people because they, they, oh my God, I felt just like that. Yeah, I did that too. And that happened to me. And you were able to recover. Maybe I can too, right? That's why Bill's story to me is so powerful. You know, the, the progression of his illness is just my life, right? It's fun. It's shits and giggles at the beginning. It's relief at the beginning. It's a solution. And then it becomes part of life. It becomes an active part of life. Then it becomes a necessity, right? Then I can't live without it. And then in the end, I'm drinking to just blot out the intolerable situation I'm in. And thank you, God, for putting me into Alcoholics Anonymous and, and giving me a clear purpose in life. I am not conflicted on what God's purpose is in my life. I am clear on what God's purpose is for me in my life. This is it. My job is to help other addicts and alcoholics. I've been, I was put on this plan. I was pulled out of that hotel room so that I could help other alcoholics and addicts get clean and sober. And, and I, I'm so clear on that today. You know, I always laugh when I hear people talk about bouncing in and out of the rooms and trying to figure out what God's will was for them. He keeps bringing you back to AA. <laughs> you know, you keep ending up back in AA. Get clear. That's God's will for you. Get sober, help other alcoholics stay sober, because that's the solution. 10, 11, and 12 is the design for living. 10, 11, and 12 is the way of life. And 12 is part of the deal. What's Bill, what is Ebby Warren's bill in his story? Unless we live a life of self-sacrifice and helpfulness to others, we won't weather the storms. We won't overcome the low spots in life. You know, because the shit's gonna hit the fan. Relationships are still gonna fail. Jobs are you're still gonna lose jobs. There's still gonna be health issues. We're going to lose loved ones. It's going to happen. How do we weather the storm? We turn towards God and step away from God. My, my former sponsor would say, "Lean in, Pat. Lean in." Right? You're either going to have a you're you're either going to have a breakthrough or a breakdown. Lean in and have a breakthrough. Right? So hey, thanks everybody for letting me be here tonight. I really appreciate uh, the opportunity and thank you, Travis. Always good to see you.